Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit. The Powell Movement. Welcome to The Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and today, my guest on the show is dead. I know, that's drastic, and it sucks, and I don't really have a dead guy on my show because I don't believe that is even possible. But what I do have is a collection of stories about the late, great Shane McConkie. And if you don't know who he is, it's really crazy that you're listening to this podcast. You should check out McConkie the movie and learn about this legend, then come check out the podcast. Because this podcast is not to tell you about how Shane was an insane skier who helped change the sport, how he was an insane base jumper and wingsuit pilot who helped change that sport. I'm not really sure if he changed wingsuit piloting or base jumping, but it sure sounds good and he probably did. I'm also not here to tell you what an incredible husband Shane was or a father he was. For the next hour, what I'm going to be doing is walking you through my weekend at the Payne McSchlunky Classic event, which is the biggest, baddest snowblade race on the planet. This is the ninth year of the PMS Classic. I've been on the mic every year. And this year, when I wasn't on the mic, I was drinking heavily, it seemed like. More than I've drank at this event or in three consecutive days in years. And when I wasn't drinking, I was trying to find some funny Shane McConkie stories from those who knew him best. Before we get into the podcast and talk about the event and all the Shane stories I got, I need to thank Sherry McConkie and the Shane McConkie Foundation for so much over the years. Being part of this event is a special thing, and the people in Squaw Valley know how to ski and party better than any other town on the planet. I'm not sure if that's a good or a bad thing, really, but it always makes for an amazing weekend. Before we get into the podcast, I want to ask you to follow me on Instagram, at The Powell Movement, tell your friends about the show, and finally, I need to ask you to support my sponsors who make this thing happen. They are Evo. Rescue Water, The Ten Barrel Brewery, and Spy Optic. Now, let's get into the podcast. So I opened my email a couple days before I'm supposed to head out to the Payne McSchlunky Classic in Squaw Valley, USA, and I get an email that says my flight that Sherry McConkie booked for me is canceled and I need to rebook. There was something going on about planes crashing and I needed to get on a different airplane. So my flight has changed, and that's where we begin. It's 3.30 a.m. I'm heading to the airport for a 6 a.m. flight. I get there, and there already is an hour-long security line at SeaTac. SeaTac Airport really sucks these days. I don't know what's happened in the past six months, but security lines there are ridiculous. Get there two and a half hours early because they are not doing something right. But I make it to the airport. I get through the line, and I get on my flight. I land in Reno. My shuttle picks me up. We go to the store, and then we head up to Squaw to Sherry's house. She's not home, but she arranged for me to get in the house, and she told me to make myself at home. So I step outside, and then I play on my phone for an hour. Then Sherry and Ayla get home. I catch up with them. And then it is time for me to head out to a dinner. I'm meeting up with the High Fives Foundation, and dinner is being held at Andy Wirth's house. Andy Wirth is one of the more polarizing figures in Squaw Valley. He's the former CEO of KSL. And in this town, it seems like there are two camps with how people feel about Andy. The first is what I saw that night at dinner. Andy Worth is an awesome guy. Super nice. He's like the best host ever kind of guy who is generous and really cares for his causes. The second camp focused on what he was doing as a CEO and how that would impact the lives of the locals. And these locals came in super passionately and it brought for some heated internet debate. The worst of which were some things said about Andy's family members. After talking to Andy, I found out he is pretty pissed off about those attacks. And while I won't quote him directly, he sure let me know that he was not happy. Anyways, I do want to thank Andy Worth for having us over for dinner. I want to apologize if I offended him in any way. That wasn't my intention. I just wanted to get his thoughts and feelings about how people felt about him in Squaw Valley. The best thing that came out of this night is the best joke that I have ever told. And I have to set the scene for you here. The High Fives Foundation brings about 30 people to the mountain for a week called Military to the Mountains. The people that they bring out have gone through intense training at the Adaptive Training Foundation in Texas with a former NFL player and all-around awesome guy, David Babora. David whips their asses into shape. The workouts at the Adaptive Training Foundation are super intense and get these guys prepared for a week on the mountain. When they get to Squaw Valley, they don't give a fuck. 
They want to ski anything and everything on the mountain. They've already been blown up by Humvees, so dropping a little cliff is no big deal to them. So I'm standing outside with a few of these guys, some of which I'd met last year, and we're all shooting the shit. One guy, and I wish I remember his name, but he has no legs and he's sitting in a wheelchair on the deck, and we're chatting it up when he spots the bling Jewish star chain that my wife had given me. And he looks at me and he says, hey, I'm Jewish too. Being quick-witted is a blessing and sometimes a curse, because I look right back at him and I have the forethought to say, I hope this doesn't offend you, man. And then I look at him and say, but you're only half Jewish. Everyone in our circle laughed, him harder than everyone else. And then I told a bunch more Jewish jokes and left. That was my Thursday night. I wake up hungover on Friday. I barely drank any water and at 6,000 feet or wherever we were at, that was not very smart. I get my stuff together and I head into town with my new friend now. Now is a Japanese guy who a few years back had asked Sherry McConkie to use the Shane McConkie logo to make some t-shirts and sell them in Japan. He gave all the money he raised from selling those t-shirts back to Sherry McConkie and the Shane McConkie Foundation and became friends with Sherry virtually. He knew this was the final year of the Shane McConkie Legacy Gala and he did not want to miss out on this amazing event. So he books himself a ticket, shows up at Sherry's house. She says, yes, you're going to stay with me throughout the weekend. You're going to have a full-on VIP experience. It was awesome to experience this event with Now, because when you look at Now, he barely speaks any English. He weighs about 90 pounds. He's 5 feet tall. He's 42 years old, but looks 22. And Now is now my new BFF. I respect the hell out of him as he comes to the States with the idea that I'm going to do everything McConkey. He reaches out to Sherry, and she's like, come. He ends up staying with her, and he will be everywhere this weekend. And have a Shane McConkey Legacy Gala experience like no other. My favorite part about now is how polite he is, how nice he is, and how psyched he is to meet just about everyone in Squaw Valley, even me. He had heard of my podcast, and when I first met him at Sherry's house... I would love to do a reenactment of how he sounded when he saw me, but that would make me sound super racist. You can imagine a very excited Japanese man coming up, bowing with his hands together, saying, oh, you're Mike Powell, very animated. I listen to you every week. It was so flattering and now is a great friend of mine. We spent a ton of time together this weekend. We really didn't say much to each other, but non-verbally, now and I are BFFs. So I gave now a Powell Movement hat, and we headed into the village to meet up with the folks who are setting up for the Payne McSlunky Legacy Gala. And the first person I bump into is Mike Rosen. Mike is the little Jewish K2 sales rep out of Northern California, and he is a great guy. And I ask him for his Shane McConkie story. It's 48 hours before the Payne McSlunky event. Standing here with sales rep extraordinaire Mike Rosen, rep of the year in what, 2014? Every year in my mind. Fair enough. Fair enough. So, Mike, you were tight with Shane. He was on K2. What's your best Shane story? Oh, one of my all-time favorites was the first time we tried to do a base jump off of the Silver Legacy. We'd been down there many times, scoping it out, figuring out how to get everything to go. And day of the event, Shane and I walk out onto the roof, and the wind's coming from a different direction than we'd ever seen when we'd been up there before. And we walk over the edge, we're looking, we're dropping pieces of paper, and Shane spits over the edge. So I spit over the edge. Shane spit over the edge. I spit over the edge. And this went on and on and on for quite a while, spitting. And lo and behold, we ended up not having the jump that day because of the wind. Later that night, went out for beers, and I told Shane how nervous I was the whole time. And he goes, oh, I was never going to jump. As soon as we saw that wind, there was no way. And I was like, well, then why did we keep spitting over the edge? And he says, I have no idea. I did it once just to see what happened. And then I just tried to see how many times I could get you to do it. <laughs> I was like, thanks, because I was on edge all day panicked and you were basically messing with me all day. And he was like, oh, yeah. So Shane was fucking with Mike. Mike tells his story. And after hanging out at setup and not doing anything but keeping people from doing their work, it's time for me to record a podcast with the most informed pro skier on the planet and one of the best and most entertaining, Cody Townsend. We finished the podcast, which you will hear soon, and we jumped right into Cody's Shane McConkie story. 
I just struggle with this one because it's always hard to pinpoint because it's just like every moment with them was really funny and fun. It's almost not even the funniest. The most special thing was what you saw him on camera was who he was in person. Like he was just that guy. That's who he was. He was always fucking with you. He was always making fun of you. He was always making fun of himself, always joking around. It was just like who he was on camera was who he was in person. I think I was in such hero reverence at the time. There were certain things that stood out to me. Like early on in my career, I asked Shane before I even really started, I was like, hey, how do you do a pro skier? What do you do? So I like took him out for a beer and for some like apres ski appetizers. And we went to Balboa and I barely knew him at the time. And I was like asking about contracts and stuff. And some guy walked over and he's like, oh, here's Shane McConkie. And he's like, hey, dude, I'm talking with my friend. Can you please fuck off essentially? And I was like, oh my God, this is so cool. So, hey, I don't know, like, the funny stories, like, there's so many. I guess, well, no, that was fucking with him, because we'd also mess with Shane, so. Was there a good one fucking with him? Yeah, that was with JT when we went over to his house and left a note for Sherry that said, don't worry, Sherry, it was just one time, it was one night, he loves you more than anything, I would not worry about a thing, and just left that note for him. What assholes. (laughs) Yeah, it was like that a lot. Yeah, then that was that. And of course, Sherry knew who we all were and probably took it better than anyone. But sometimes that didn't go over so well. There's one time I was standing on top of a cliff. It was like a cliff I hadn't seen anyone hit before. It was like gapping over all these big cliffs. It was like a 60 foot drop. And I just kind of sidestepped down to the edge. And I was 16 at the time. And because Squaw has her chairlifts really close to all the terrain, Shane Scott and JT on the chair. And I'm just like kind of looking at it, seeing if it's even doable. And I just hear him, go, go, you (laughs) pussy, go. And then I'm like, oh, and I start sidestepping to get out of there because I'm like, what do I do? I don't want to hit this. And they're like, 10, 9. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, God, oh, God. It was like so impressionable and definitely with Shane yelling at you directly to go do it. So when they did hit one, I turned the skis and went and hucked that huge cliff. It's like 60 foot to flap over this whole gapping air. And they're all cheered. I was like, yes, they did it. But that was Shane. It was probably a stupid move to do. It's funny what peer pressure can make you do, especially when that peer pressure comes from Shane McConkey, JT Holmes, and Scott Gaffney on a chairlift. Cody lived to tell the story. The rest of my Friday is heading over to the High Fives Foundation military to the mountains award ceremony, then over to dinner with Sherry McConkey and the foundation. Then we had beers and then it was time for bed. Saturday is the big event and I only have two average stories recorded right now, so I'm not exactly killing it yet. And tomorrow is game day. I'm going to be on the mic a whole lot and I've got to make a lot of Shane McConkey stories happen. I wake up on Saturday and I get ready to head over to registration for the PMS Classic It's 8 o'clock in the morning, and people are already in full costume. They're signing their paperwork and getting ready for the most important runs of their lives. It's a Chinese downhill with 60 snollerbladers on top of the world's most talked-about lift, KT-22. The only rule is that you have to be on skis shorter than 100 centimeters, and you have to wear a helmet. That's it. The racers were primed early on, feeling really good. When it was all said and done, It was Michelle Parker and Ben Pichotti taking the win and being known now as the greatest snollerbladers to ever walk or snollerblade the planet. Once the race was over, I bumped into my good friend Mike Goot, who delivers his McConkie story, which is the first great one. The PMS Chinese Downhill has just ended. I'm standing here with Mike Goot, former global marketing manager at K2 Skis and the guy that signed Shane McConkie to K2. And Mike, tell us about your first experience traveling with McConkie. So I didn't actually sign Shane, but at the same time, we signed Shane as K2. And the first trip we went on, we flew into Munich, Germany. We all flew in on different flights and we headed over to the Moven Pick Hotel in Munich. I got the room with Shane. So we go up to the room, get our bags kind of thrown in the room, and I go in to take a piss real quick. Then I hear Shane saying, hey, hey, man, hey, man, I got this weird spot. And I was taking a piss. I was like, hold on, hold on. Give me a second. So uh, he's like, dude, I have this really weird spot. You got to come check it out. 
So I turn the corner out of the bathroom after I finished pissing, and my eyes basically exploded in my head. He was on all fours with his pants down, spreading his butt cheek, telling me, look at this brown spot. Is it really weird? Should I be alarmed? And that was my introduction to Shane. From that point on, I don't think I ever stopped laughing. So Goot's story was amazing. And the whole time he was telling it, I had to piss so bad I could taste it. I'm holding it and holding it. I'm holding it. Goot finally finishes his story. I'm right next to where my condo is. So I figure I'll go to my condo and use the restroom. I break out my key card. I use it for the downstairs door. It lets me in. I wait for the elevator in agony. I get up to my floor, make it to my room. The pain gets worse as I'm close to the bathroom. I put my key in my door and I get the dreaded red button. My key doesn't work. I'm almost in tears because I have to pee so bad. I'm pretty much holding my crotch. I get back in the elevator and start heading downstairs to go find another bathroom somewhere. But I realize I have another key in my pocket. So I push the three button and I head back up again. I didn't even get off the elevator and I run straight to my room. I put the other key in the door and boom, that key is red too. I'm fucked. I'm going to piss my pants right now. I'm pretty much in tears. I don't know what to do. And then I see a trash can. Needless to say, I didn't get a drop anywhere. I was kind of incognito. I'm sure I'm on video camera somewhere and I'm sure it would make a great America's Funniest Home Videos clip. No one caught me while I was doing it. I do want to apologize to everyone at the hotel and in Squaw Valley, but I figured the trash can was way better than peeing my pants. The funny thing is, I haven't even started drinking yet, but it's 9.30 a.m., and that's what's going to happen. And the place to be in Squaw Valley at this time of day is the slot bar. Although some folks did head back up KT and skied some gnarly lines on their snowblades. I know Negatron, Josh Anderson... He had a gnarly one that was sent to me. and People were getting after it on their snowblades in honor of McConkie, and the rest of us were drinking. While we were at the slot bar, I ran into Scott Gaffney and ski racer Bryce Bennett and spoke with them for a few minutes. Standing here with Scott Gaffney, we just saw the Payne McSchlonke, and we have an Olympian here who actually didn't even come close to doing well in this contest. I don't know your name because I can't remember it, but I know you're an Olympian. It's like <laughs> seventh in downhill, and first, what's your name? My name is Bryce Bennett. Bryce Bennett, so part of the U.S. Olympic team, and I should know Bryce, but I don't know much about ski racing, Bryce, but I know... What happened today out there? Because you didn't do it on the shorter skis. You're the biggest competitor here, the best athlete here, and it just didn't work out. What happened? Yeah, you know, I had had high expectations. We did too, man. We did too. Yeah, yeah. the expectations, they really got a hold of me at the start. And I just, I kind of cracked under the pressure. And this snowblade contest is harder than the Hanukkah downhill. It's more important, at least. It's way more important and way harder. And I didn't expect the leg burn that I experienced. I got to the top of the exhibition and I was like, I don't know if I'm going to make it. But, you know, you got to persevere and, you know, it didn't, I didn't take the, the right line. I got to I gotta go back and look at video, analyze. More, more training, then, more training. More training, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. snowblade training. Well, we've seen other Olympians and great athletes. Darren Ralphs is in this once. He does what you do, but he won this event. And then it's like you're coming in kind of like the next ski racer who has a chance. I think he plays 12th, which is... Kind yeah. You know, well, not even in the top 10, 10 result, you know. Well, look for him at the next Olympics, but not on snowblades because he doesn't have the speed. But I'm here with Gaffney. Gaffney, I've been asked to think of a story about Shane McConkie for a while because Scott knew him for a long time. They're best friends. And Scott's like, I don't know what story I'm going to tell. So then I just started recording and the microphone's in his face. Scott, give us the laugh out loud story that you have. Uh, you know, I got to go with the most recent thing that comes to mind because I'm struggling. But I just, they're playing, uh, there's something about McConkie in the bar here. And I just saw the scene where Shane replied to my brother's wedding invite by telling my brother's future in-laws that he was my brother's gay lover. And he would not be attending because he was down in South America seeking breakthrough treatment for his age, which my brother gave him. He just said, I am Rob's gay lover. I will not be attending because I will be in South America seeking treatment for my age, which Rob gave me. And then I ended with, please warn your daughter. But there, was, there was more in there. I can't remember it all. But it just finished with, please warn your daughter. And they got it. They're like, what the hell is this? Yeah. That's just fresh in my mind because I see it on the screen, but I could come up with thousands, but it's just hard to pull that little rabbit out of the hat other than that one right there. That's the right pull. Thank you very much. (laughs) 
Gaffney delivered with an amazing story. I see another one of Shane's best friends, JT Holmes, and run up to JT to get some information. JT Holmes did not win. He actually was the only one using poles out there today. And that is totally illegal. He's using Nordic poles. And JT let me know that he did a Nordic race recently, which is pretty amazing. But JT, you were best friends with Shane McConkey and have a ton of stories. <laughs> but what are you going to share with us today? So it was 1997 or 6 or something like that. There was big news out of Chile that Seth Morrison and Steve Winter and others had been in a helicopter crash that involved a fatality. It was pretty serious. Steve sustained a spinal cord injury. T.R. Youngstrom died. It was bad, real bad thing, you know, quite serious. And I was over at Shane's house. I'd only known Shane for about a year or two by then. And he ends up getting a phone call from Steve Winter. First thing Shane says, hey, Steve, your dick still work? (laughs) So JT painting the picture of how Shane could cross the line, but do it in a fun, non-malicious manner. Always good to see JT. And this time I actually got to hang out with JT Holmes. Most likely, this is one of the few times he's ever hung out with me when he wasn't paid to hang out with me or he was doing it for charity. Anyways, I learned that JT has a girlfriend, Rory, who is awesome and she's a professional ultra marathon runner. She gets 7 to 10 Jeopardy questions correct every time according to JT and I don't even know what that means. She's also into Nordic skiing and JT is getting into that too. He's also figuring out his car race thing. I like JT and that's the update on Mr. Holmes. At this point, I'm going to take a quick break and talk about my sponsors. And my first sponsor is Evo, and they've supported the podcast since day one. If you're a fan of the show, I hope you buy your skis, snowboard, bikes, outerwear, everything from Evo. They're the best retail experience in Denver, Seattle, Portland, and Whistler. And their website, evo.com, features the best prices, an amazing user experience, a no-hassle return policy, and free shipping on orders over $50. If you're in store, let them know you listen to the Powell Movement and you'll get an additional 10% off. My next sponsor is Rescue Water, and each week I tell you how Rescue Water is proactive recovery. But what does that mean to you? Well, think of it like this. If you're really tired, you skip the coffee and grab an energy drink. Well, if you really need to hydrate, like after you get off the hill, finish a workout, or get home from a big night, make the smart choice and drink a cold Rescue Water. It replaces electrolytes much better than your traditional sports drink. It's a difference I can feel every time. It works. Make it work for you by heading over to rescuewater.com, that's R-E-S-Q water.com, and save 20% on a 12 or 24 pack case with the code R-E-S-Q water T-P-M. That's all one word. Rescue Water is also available on Amazon. Those are my sponsors. After talking to JT, I walk over to Bistro 22 to get some lunch, and I see George Jelty. And to tell you the truth, George is usually destroyed at this point. You can barely look into his eyes at 10 a.m. after the McConkie has gone on. But today, that is not the case. He looks calm, and I catch him walking out of the bathroom and see if he has anything funny to say. He doesn't, but he does share an interesting story. I'm here with George Jelty, Squaw Valley local, been here forever, and has a great Shane McConkie story. He's not sure if it's great or not, but we're going to let him tell it anyway. George, what do you got? So the first Payne McConkie I participated in, Shane was still alive. Cody Townsend and I were about 16 years old. We signed up, obviously, because he was our idol, and we show up to this event, and there is Red Bull, and let's just say some other spirits going around heavy and at the end of the day Cody and I are still in the runnings crushing it we're getting ready for the Chinese downhill and Shane looks over at us and he's like wait how old are you guys and we're like we're 16 and he's like dude I've been fucking feeding you cocktails all day like can't believe you guys would show up for this thing or whatever and it was a pretty special moment because we always looked up to him and he didn't give shit how old you were or who you were or what you did he just wanted to have a good time with people who were in a similar mindset now it is time for awards and the costume contest so i head over to the sun deck and we see people who have been drinking for quite a few hours at this point having fun on the sun deck in their costumes 
I am getting loose on the microphone. This is the one event where there really are no rules for me. It's keep it family friendly. Don't say any bad words. But other than that, have a good time. And looking out amongst the crowd, there were a lot of laughs throughout the day. And that's always a fun thing to deliver. And after the costume contest and awards, I end up seeing Errol Kerr. Errol sticks out in the world of Squaw Valley, known as the first Jamaican to ever win the Golden Saucer at the PMS a few years back. And when you are a Golden Saucer winner, you always stick out. So I'm standing here with Errol Kerr, who is a Jamaican Olympian, huh? Yeah, so I finished ninth place in the 2010 Winter Olympics, which is the highest placement ever for a Caribbean athlete in the Winter Olympics. But long story short... Um, wait, wait, wait. First, I got questions about the Jamaican Olympic team. You don't look Ja Rastafari at all. What's going on with that? So my mom graduated Stanford, ended up traveling the world, landed in Jamaica, married my dad, was there for 10 years, and then moved the family back here to the States. So I was born here in the U.S., I'm a citizen by descent, you know, I wasn't born on the island, but I was born here in the main in the main states. Anyways, I grew up here, came through the Squaw Valley, you know, ski team program, and eventually made the U.S. ski team, and uh, had some success at the World Cup, X Games, and, and other things, and was able to use that momentum to break away and put together my own program to go to the 2010 Winter Olympics, where we ended up finishing ninth place in the world, which is the highest placement ever for a Caribbean athlete in the Winter Games. You're like the Jamaican bobsled team, but different. <laughs> well, it's just a one-man team over here. I mean, uh, bobsledging, that's a team. This is a, a person just going out against the world. All right, well, let's talk about why we're talking. We're here for Shane McConkey, and he had an influence on your life. You're a little bit younger than him, and you used to see him in the lift lines. Tell me about the influence he had on you. <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, absolutely. I mean, growing up here, I came through the Sugar Bowl like ski team, and at 10 years old, I had to transfer here to Squaw. If you wanted to be a skier, you came to Squaw. I mean, we have KT. That is a coach in itself. If you can shred that lift from the time it opens to the time it closes, you will become a great skier. So, anyways, growing up here, you know, by the time I was like 11, 12, 13 years old, Shane McConkey was out rewriting the books on what free skiing is, what extreme skiing can be. He was like not only just setting the bar, but he was like taking it to places where we never even imagined it could be. And so to be able to line up in the lift line with him in the morning, look at him in just awe and glory was like such an awe-inspiring experience. And what he did is not only did he take skiing from like being this like, I don't know, call it like superhero, you get built up with all these people around you that like think you're super badass, but he took it and brought it right back to what it really is. Like, that's why we're here for the Payne McSwanky. We're all here on short skis, which is ridiculous. And it's ridiculous that we got paid to ski. And so for me to be part of that, to be to, to make a living skiing for a while, to be part of what Shane did here was like so special. And I mean, not only that, I mean, look at you have Squaw. You have a whole book called Squallywood. Shane McConkey wrote that book. Every line here that is ski today that people talk about in the bar, Shane pioneered it. So, and you were saying about him as well that he was the guy that took the Hollywood aspect and brought it to like, hey, we're going to do this right under the chair. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. So I, I would say before Shane, like people obviously got rad scheme. But what Shane did is that we're going to not take this from the backcountry or do it. We're going to go do it right in front of everybody. So there's a finger race every powder day on KT because of Shane. When the Palisades open here at Squaw Valley, everybody goes up there and there's a crowd that lines up at the bottom to watch because of Shane. Because he wanted it to be a show that happens in real time. He brought extreme skiing to real time in front of people here at Squaw Valley USA. So at this point, I am catching a good buzz. I've got to speak more on a microphone in a few hours and do that in a tuxedo. So it's time for me to head back to the hotel and take a nap for a few hours. I wake up, put on my tux, my Jewish star gold chain, and then I accessorize my jacket with the pin that Johan Malkowski gave me, which is a metal pin in the shape of a bag. It says Bon Appetit on it, and it has a bunch of dicks sticking out of it. It's an amazing pin, and I felt that this was the place to wear it. So I'm off to sound check at the auction with Roy Tuscany. And after we get through sound check, it is time for the party to start. The party itself is crazy. Tickets for this thing are $150. There are 450 people there, and Sherry and her crew know how to do shit right. From the decor to Mustache Harbor, our yacht rock band, 
to the best DJs in Northern California, Headphones and Horses, made up of DJ Silver Boombox Thief and Mary Poppin, to the booze. They spare no expense, and the event is all time every year. And then it comes time for the auction, because while we are there to party our faces off, the real thing about the Shane McConkie Legacy Gala is that we are raising money for the Shane McConkie Foundation, which you can find out about over at www.shaneMcConkie.org. So we're there to do some good and to raise a lot of money. And in a ski town, you never know what to expect when you come to a live auction. Most people don't have real jobs with real money, so to raise a ton of money for this Shane McConkie Foundation could be tough. With our first two auction items, we only raised $4,500, which in past experience isn't that good for Roy Tuscany and I. We expect to raise more for the foundation. Our third item, it's a Santa Cruz bike. They make fantastic bikes that everyone in Squaw Valley wants, and we know that thing's going to sell for a lot of money. It's worth ten grand. It sells for six grand. So another item that we don't make our money on. And while we're not trying to turn a profit, we're trying to create some great things for the kids. So our last item is a truly one-of-a-kind item. It is called a split tune. And the visionaries at K2 Skis were thinking, what would Shane build if he could build any ski on the planet? And they thought he would probably want something that should never, ever be built. It's a mono ski, which Shane was a huge fan of. But... With all the rage of split boarding these days, they thought Shane might want to see mono skiers getting out in the backcountry. And to do that, the engineers at K2 created a one of a kind split tune, which is a split mono ski. Yes, there is no real purpose for this being built. It's kind of like building a condom with holes in it. No one will actually use this. It's one of a kind. And we were able to raise a shit ton of money for this. This thing sold for $18,500. So once we were able to raise that type of money, we realized the evening was going to be even more successful than we thought. Spirits are at an all-time high. And when I put the mic down, the first person I see is Flip McCrick. And I decide it's time for me to get some more Shane McConkie stories. And with Flip, I had to cut him off a few times because he was trying to get too sentimental. Not telling a funny story like I wanted. But then he tried. Your background includes Freeze Magazine, which is all you need to say, which means you helped shape the sport of skiing. You really did with that magazine. And you had a lot of time with McConkie during your day. And I'm asking everybody for their best McConkie story that really sums up who he is and what do you got? Finn Flappin' Flounder here. In the early 90s, I was a world pro mogul tour photographer. And I met Shane. And we ended up traveling around the world and building our careers together. He was a live comic book character. I think Gaffney said it best in one of the articles after he died. He was like, it's kind of like Superman died. And knowing that you you want to get all sentimental about your relationship, that's not what we're looking for here. We want your funny Shane McConkie story. We're like, I can't believe he fucking did that. And you still tell people this story to this day just to explain who Shane was. Okay, we're at SIA after a rip girl party. Shane's got his marker in his hand. He's been signing autographs all day. We go by the skiing magazine booth, and there's a double-page spread that I had in him. It was called Up Front. It was a nice double-page spread. So Shane has to deface this thing. It was something I asked him to do. There was some beautiful tree shadows kind of up near Mount Rose. I asked him to get out of the car and hike up there and make a few turns through the shadows. And he hated doing things like that. He thought it was posing. He really was not happy with me. But he did it. So therefore, he was happy to get a double-page spread in Skiing Magazine, which was kind of rare for Shane. He was all over the rest of the magazines, but not so much skiing. So here's to you, Shane, at any rate. We miss you, buddy. After I finished with Flip, I head back to the party. I'd love to say I danced and drank until 4 in the morning, but I don't dance, and I did drink until about 1 a.m., Then I head back to the hotel. I pass out, wake up early the next morning to have breakfast with the McConkie Foundation board. Then it's up on the hill. It was a beautiful day. We skied at Squaw for a few hours, then drank at the Chamois, had dinner with Sherry and many others, and then I was back to Seattle on Monday morning. When I get home and start listening to what I've recorded, I realize I came up with a few really funny stories, and I know that there's thousands more out there. So I decided that this is going to be an annual podcast for me. 
every year around March 26th, I'm going to put a podcast of Shane McConkie stories together. I'm going to talk to friends, professional skiers, business partners, everyone in his life. And over the years, we are going to get a comprehensive laugh track from Shane McConkie because the dude was the funniest human being on the planet. And it would be a shame if these stories weren't told. I'm going to try to do it. For now, listening to the recordings that I have, I still need more. So I decide I'm going to call up a few people that I know will have some great stories, and I'm going to have them drop some more McConkie knowledge. The first person I call up is a ski legend, a dude who used to be a K2 athlete and employed by K2. He worked with Shane on ski design, and when I asked him for a funny story, He didn't get what he was supposed to do either, because while he dropped some knowledge about Shane, I can't say this is a laugh out loud one, but it's some great stuff from my cat trip. Early days, I was down at Powder Magazine, and McConkie happened to be there at the same time. We were all talking, and this is when fat skis were just coming out. And McConkie, of course, was one of the early adopters when all the other good skiers were saying, oh, fat skis, fat tourists. McConkie was grabbing them and going 50 miles an hour. And Casimiro, who was the editor at the time, says, you know, I don't like him because you don't get down low and you don't get face shots. And McConkie just deadpan said, if you're getting face shots, you're going too slow, which is total McConkie. But it shows what a visionary he was, too. You know, of course, he's the one that pushed the whole rocker thing. And I was always hesitant to a lot of these new things. I was a little slower to jump on board with fat skis and not shape so much, but rocker and McConkie was like, I want shocks on my skis. You know, we tried that once. We put some, you know, rubber underneath the binding. He goes, no, 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 no. I'm not talking about rubber. I'm talking about mountain bike shocks. I want to be able to jump off a 40 foot cliff to the flat and just coom. And I used to laugh because I chuckled at some of his other ideas. And I go, well, you know what? Who knows? Maybe so. Yeah, he was always pushing the boundaries of what was possible or what anybody even thought about. Thanks to McConkie, we are what we are today. After I talked to Mike, I decided I'd reach out to Matchstick Productions and Murray Weiss because Matchstick had a huge impact on Shane's career trajectory and Murray Weiss was a big part of that, not in height, but behind the camera. And I talked to Murray about the early days of filming with Shane McConkie. I first met him, and the first time we were filming with him, he aired off of a cornice and went for a double back and landed right on his head. And I was a newbie filmer, and we were pretty far in the backcountry. And he tried to tell us that he clearly had this jump and he had this stunt, no problem. He's going to go back and hit it again. And I was standing there like, this guy's nuts. There's no way he has it. He's not a good enough skier to do this. He was so far off. He's going to break his neck. What's going to happen? He goes up there behind the cornice takes off all of his clothes and goes, okay, dropping. I'm down there as a cameraman, just gripped, and he flies off the cornice naked. It's pretty solid. Classic McConkie. Now I'm going to take a final sponsor break, and my next sponsor is Spy Optic. And Spy is an independent Southern California optics company that has defined what style looks like in the sunglass and goggle world since 1994. They are a fun-loving family of athletes and artists who create the best products on the market. This year, the Spy team developed what is arguably the best goggle ever made, the Ace EC. It features electrochromic one-lens technology, which means you have three different lenses built in your goggle and you can change them with the push of a button. It's so game-changing that I can't offer you a special discount on this amazing goggle, but what I can do is offer you 20% off anything else on spyoptic.com. To get that discount, head on over to spyoptic.com, enter the code TPM, the number 20, that's all one word, and you will get 20% off. My final sponsor is the 10 Barrel Brewery out of Bend, Oregon. They have been brewing the Northwest's best beer since 2006, and they encourage everyone to go drink some of their beer outside. Why? Because 10 Barrel is all about the outside. They live and breathe the snow and bike lifestyle and support it with events, like the final two hella big air events of the season. The next one is coming up at Mount Bachelor on March 30th, and I'll be on the mic. And the final stop is April 6th at Sierra at Tahoe. If you're anywhere near, these are events you are not going to want to miss. Next time you're at the store, pick up some 10 Barrel. 
And to find out more about the beer that supports action sports, the events, and their pubs, head on over to 10barrel.com. Those are my sponsors, and now we'll get back into the podcast. If Matchstick was important to the growth of Shane's career, Freeze Magazine was arguably just as important. Before social media, it was all magazines and movies. And Nate Abbott started as an intern at Freeze Magazine and worked there until they shut down. Nate is a super talented photographer, artist personality that is very active with political opinions on social media, and he worked a lot with Shane McConkey. I was doing the K2 staff photographer thing, traveling. I actually ended up dropping out of college and moving to Crested Butte. It was like just being K2's staff photographer was the pinnacle of what someone like me dreamed of when I dropped out of college. The failing of Freeze Magazine turned into the launch of a little thing that we did for, I think, two years at K2 that we just called K2 Skis Magazine. That winter, I ended up on a trip. It was like kind of a last minute thing that I didn't think I was going to be on because I was mostly doing the freestyle stuff. We ended up going to Engelberg, Switzerland. It was McConkey, Seth Morrison, and it was actually a Warren Miller film crew. The entire week was insane. I shot the Gravity Games. I was shooting that for this big corporate entity that was doing Gravity Games. I spent the 36 hours before I left for Europe in front of a computer. I like barely slept just threw stuff into the bag. Never been so exhausted. Seth and I rolled into Engelberg and got on the lift. We did the overnight flight. We landed in Switzerland in the morning, took the train, rolled up, and it had been snowing for days, and it was Bluebird. The first thing I did, we met the Warren Miller filmer and Shane up on the hill, and before we even said hi to Shane, he does a backflip off a fucking 50-foot cliff. And then he skis up and it's like, hey, what's up, guys? Good to see you. It's like they weren't going to like wait around for Seth and me to show up. We were a day or two behind. And that's the way skiing is. When the shooting is good, you shoot. And there's all this stuff that comes out about his personality and his craziness and all of that, but he was out there doing it. He wasn't grumbling about it. Nate, your story's not very funny. Sorry, I like ramble, pal, you know. So anyway, Engelberg, we have a couple of really great days, work hard, and honestly, we got what we needed in the first couple of days, and it, it was sunny. It went to like 60 degrees. There like big avalanches coming down everywhere. Spring had sprung. One day we were skiing in north facing Powell Field and the opposite south facing slope just slid to grass. And it's like we're all talking about this morning it was winter and now it's the sound of brick and music. So we got what we were going to get and basically it was operate time. And Seth... And I called Mike Goot and asked if we could fly home early. We basically just wanted to leave because there was no point in sticking around. The snow had gone. It was fun. It was beautiful spring skiing, but it's not like going to make it into the magazine or into the movie. Right. Basically, K2 had put a lot of money into Warren Miller and having all of us over there. And Goot said, no, you got to stay for the extra four days or whatever. And so Seth and I did as mature, well-adjusted, mid-20s athletes and photographers do, and we got hammered that night. That's the kind of shit that makes Seth super pissed. Yeah, yeah, Seth was super pissed. I wasn't as pissed as him, but there was other shit to do. I wanted to go build jumps in Austria or something. But we were there. So we got drunk and Shane starts talking to me about going base jumping because he had been base jumping a bunch on the trip. And I kind of had like said some stuff like, ah, whatever, it's just jumping off a cliff. 
So we got drunk and he started showing me through the whole process and he convinces me that I can totally go ski base the next day. <laughs> he did at the end of that night, I passed out on the couch and he drew a penis on my back and wrote fuck Bush on the top of my shaved head. <laughs> and so I wake up the next morning. I'm like, that was a good old drunk drink it blue night. Kind of go on our way. We go up and ski a little bit. Then Shane starts talking. He's like, yeah, you know, you said you were going to base jump. Fuck, man. I did. And we dorked around that day. We ended up shooting some groomer stuff. And so we did stuff. And then the next day, Shane's like, no, seriously, Nate, you said you were going to do it. And I, I was like, you know, screw it. What am I going to do? Like when I'm old and gray, am I going to say, yeah, one time Shane McConkey told me he'd take me ski basing. Or am I going to say, one time I went ski basing? So I woke up that second morning. I was like, yeah, I'm totally down. Let's do this. Then he kind of seemed to get a little nervous. He did a jump right under the titless rotor bond. It was used in the movies. He backflipped this thing. But it's a really simple diving board. It was 270 feet or something like that. It was a simple setup. You see the diving board, you point it at the diving board, follow McConkey's track and straight into it, hold the drone parachute for a count of whatever it was, and then let it go. And the parachute will open and make sure you don't hit the rock face and just like fly on down. <laughs> and it, he like made it seem really simple. No problem. But then he was also Shane, so he's like kind of making fun of me. I had been snowboarding a lot, and so I was kind of awkward on the skis. Then he's telling me, maybe we should go ground launch you so you know how to fly the parachute. Because I had never base jumped, obviously. I was not a professional level skier. Had you skydived before? I had done a tandem skydive like years ago. So he's like, maybe we should ground launch you and like learn how to fly i'm like you know man the snow is sketchy it's 60 degrees there's starting to be like the afternoon wet slab avalanches i don't want to be fucking around with the snow conditions when i'm already doing something ridiculously stupid right as a non-skier as a photographer skiing straight off a 270 foot cliff so i just say no we're gonna do it we're doing it right now we go down into the bottom. I take a few super nervous pictures of him packing the chute. He's like, man, just remember the other night. And I'm like, dude, I was so drunk the other night. You <laughs> talked me back through it. So it's like, you got to remember, release the little slip knots. You pull the cords down. Like, I forget all the terminology now. It was more than 10 years ago, obviously. Yeah. So he just talks me through as we ride the rotor bond back up. He puts me in it his Red Bull helmet with a little microphone on the ear. And he filmed a little intro of me like, hey, Nate, what are you going to do? Jump off that? Who's the idiot sending you off of that? He was so calm and like, yeah, you can do this, but also not super precious with it. Like, oh, you got to make sure you do this and that. It's like, hold on to it for a second. Let go. Make sure you let go of it. Then the chute will open, make sure you clear the dongles and make sure you get those knots out was like the biggest thing that he stressed. But there was like no stress. There was no like, fuck, man, this is really sketchy. This is the heaviest moment of your life. Oh, my God. I'm getting nervous talking about it right now. <laughs> he just like, this is what you do. Don't fuck up. And oh, yeah, I'm going to make fun of you because you suck at skiing. And he was still making fun of me. So he like skis down below and then gets on the radio. He's like, do it, point it. And I go down, I make a couple of super weird, janky turns because the snow is terrible. And I think the thing that really freaked me out is I hadn't skied without poles. A totally weird experience skiing big skis on really bad spring snow but i went off the freaking cliff 
And I've held the drone shoot probably not as long as I could have, but I let it go and the shoot opens perfect. And I'm like, yes, yes. And I pull on the little dongles to like release these slip knot things and make the biggest rookie mistake, which is I pull them all the way down, which slows the parachute down. So I flutter down to the ground, penduluming because I stalled the chute. And I land in this little pocket of pow. It was like jumping off a 15 foot cliff. I like came in just fine, even though the video looks absolutely terrifying. And yeah, that's kind of it. Greatest experience of my life. It's one of those things that will indelibly be in my mind. And it happened because Shane was just crazy enough to be kind of like a jerk to me about, oh, you wouldn't jump off that cliff, but also so confidence inspiring and matter of fact about it. And everything he did around me, at least, was like that, where he was taking it very serious, but not taking it too serious or treating it like something that was so special that it couldn't be infected with a fart in the middle of it or dropping your pants or skiing naked or whatever. While we're talking about jumping off of things, I might as well bring another amazing athlete who happens to be the best in the world at his craft, Andy Farrington. Andy spent a lot of time in the sky with Shane McConkie. And while Andy sometimes can be reserved, he's got a wicked sense of humor. And I'm sure when he was around McConkie, that came out even more. So let's see what Andy Farrington has to say about his time with Shane. One of the funnier ones is that we're just out cruising on a team road trip as the Rebel Air Force. And we had too many vans cruising along and everything. And we we're going across these train tracks and everything. And he was driving one of the front minivans. And the gate wasn't quite shutting yet or whatever, but you could see it was kind of about to. And they pulled their minivan through or whatever. And just on the other side of the gate, they stop and then the gate shuts. So basically, the minivan that I'm in and half of our team is trapped on the inside of the gate. And he gets out of their rental car in front of us and just kind of smiles and waves at us and everything as we're all stuck on the train tracks with the gate shut and everything. As we're all freaking out, we back up a little bit, lift the gate up manually and everything like that and slide out. Plenty of time not to get ran over by the train, but it was definitely one of the things that he thought was just pretty entertaining, just messing with people one way or another, just about 24-7. Next, I talked to Kim Reichhelm. Kim knew McConkie for a long, long time. When I think of Kim, she is awesome. She's a strong woman who's been a pro skier forever and has a successful business built around her skiing. The great thing about Kim is she's not afraid to get loose and she throws down. Let's see what Kim has to say about Shane. One year, I flew down to Cabo to meet my girlfriend, Lotsi, who is also a really good friend of Shane's and helped start IFSA with him. And I got to Cabo and it was just awful. I hated it. It was just had changed so much and it was so busy and it wasn't my scene. So Lotsi and I went on a road trip up the coast and found a place called Nine Palms, which is on the East Cape of Baja. This place was just magical. It was absolutely incredible. And it was everything that Cabo wasn't. And in a couple of days, Shane was flying in with Lotsi's boyfriend, Brant Moles. And they had a condo in town. And Lotsi and I sort of secretly set out to tell the boys that we were going to go out to Nine Palms just to check it out, to do some surfing. None of us had ever surfed in our lives. And we had like a couple of rickety cars. And so Lotsi and I drugged Shane and Brant to the hardware store. And we bought tarps and poles and coolers and tons of food and tons of water. And the whole time, you know, Shane, he doesn't really question much except for makes fun of everything that you're doing all the time. And he was just like, God, why are we getting all of this stuff for just one day? And Lotsi and I knew that they wouldn't want to camp, but we also knew once we got them there, they would want to camp. So we kind of planned to get them there and stay there because it was a long haul. It's like 20 miles on a dirt road that you can only go 10 miles an hour on to get out there. So we get boogie boards and surfboards and we're just like the full kooks go surfing up the East Cape with Brant and Shane and Lotsi and myself. We get to Nine Palms and Shane's just like out of his mind. It's like he's never seen any place so beautiful. And the funny part, I mean, Shane's just freaking funny. He just was constantly making fun of everything. And he jumps out of the 
convertible Volkswagen and literally like rips off his clothes and jumps in the water. And it's just like 80 degrees and perfectly warm and nobody around. So we unload the car and get kind of a little makeshift camp set up. And we all decide that we're going to go surfing. None of us know how. And actually, over the years, as we continued to go down there, and Sherry became a part of Shane's life, and we were all sort of spending a lot of time at Nine Palms and surfing, Shane could not surf to save his life. It was hilarious because he's such a phenomenal athlete. He never learned how to surf? He never did. No, he didn't. He was pretty bad. I think he was intimidated. You know, the water and the waves and that whole scene, if it's not something that's been in your life, is really intimidating. It takes a long time just to build a comfort level with that. Shane didn't have a lot of the ocean in his life, so he was a little bit outside of his comfort zone. And whenever you're as funny as he is or was, you make fun of your discomfort. That's what Shane did was constantly make fun of himself anyway. So he was just the biggest kook. I mean, if Shane were alive today, social media would not be the same because with kook slams and kook of the day and Jerry of the day, I mean, he would be like posting (laughs) nonstop with silly Shane antics. It was just hilarious to watch him on the water outside of his comfort zone, just being a complete spaz. And he struggled with it. And he actually was, you know, very honest. He's like, I'm just not a surfer. This is not my sport. But the cool part of the story was that several years later, we've all sort of refined our camping and Sherry is a part of the gang. And we're all been down there for a while. And there's a hurricane coming into Nine Palms. We decided to break up camp and move up north to Cabo Pomo, where it's a little bit more protected. On our way up, we all decide that we're going to eat. So we're out of our minds. We're laughing our asses off. At one point, there's a large gecko or iguana, and we see it run across the road, and it goes into a, a hole. And Shane's like, stop the car, stop the car, stop the car. And Shane jumps out of the car. And this iguana is like halfway in this hole on the side of the road with its legs flapping, its tail flipping all over the place. And Shane takes the iguana and grabs it by its body and pulls it out of the hole. And attached to the iguana is this massive snake. And the snake's got the iguana, its head in its mouth. (laughs) Nobody would have ever done that. And he's like, that's the coolest thing ever. And he's dragging the snake. And the snake's getting bigger and bigger as he's dragging the snake out of the hole. And finally, he realized that the snake wasn't going to let go of the iguana. So he just sort of walked away. And we all got back in the car and continued up the road. And we get to Cabo Pomo, and Cabo Pomo was developed by Dick Barrymore, wow. the famous ski film cinematographer. And Shane had never met Dick before, and Dick's a good friend of mine just through the whole Baja connection and years of being down there. Shane must have loved Dick. Oh, my God. So this is incredible. So, you know, at first we get there, and they set us up at a place to sleep. There's a gang of us. I think there's like six or seven of us. It's starting to get dark. and kind of settled down. And I introduced Shane to Dick. And Dick was like, McConkey, Jim McConkey's kid? And Shane's like, yep. And Dick proceeds to sit down for like three hours and tell us stories about Jim McConkey and the days of filming back in the 60s, 50s and 60s. That's incredible. It was so amazing. Like I've never seen Shane so quiet. Shane's always got something to say. He's always interrupting. He was always making fun. He was always just making light of any serious situation. He always had something to contribute, even when it was serious. And he was so quiet. He asked a few questions, but Dick had the floor. And Dick was an incredible storyteller. For him to tell Shane stories about his dad, it was so heartwarming and so amazing. It was amazing for Shane to hear stories about his dad because he didn't have a close relationship with his dad and his dad didn't share those things with him. And a lot of the reason why Shane became who he was was because of that. It was really, really special. And although not the funniest of Shane's stories, probably for me, one of the most moving, I felt really fortunate to be able to connect Dick and Shane and have them spend that time together. Well, I know Shane loved to be connected to Dick, but... Not the funniest story. There's some funny parts, but Kim, the beauty of this is every year around this time, I'm going to do a funny McConkie stories podcast because there's so many of them. And you told one of your heartwarming ones. And I know you have laugh out loud funny ones. And I'm going to come back to you next year. And you are going to make me laugh on this podcast. (laughs) You got it. 
Our last story will come from one of the loose cannons of Squaw Valley. And when I started putting together this McConkey episode, if you told me that Aaron McGovern would take this more serious than anyone else, and he would write out his own personal eulogy to Shane McConkey, or at least that's how he described it to me, I would have told you you were crazy, because McGovern's not going to put that much time into it. But I sure was wrong, and what Aaron has to say is quite amazing. Let's go to Aaron McGovern. So you asked me for a short story, so it only seemed appropriate that I do it on his 10-year death anniversary. He changed my life in so many ways. First, by creating the IFSA. And with the IFSA, our crazy sport had a governing body and a ranking system, allowing us to get sponsored. Not only in the start, I'm still coaching the kids competing in the IFSA today. One of my favorite things he did for me was to teach me how to base jump. I won the first PMS Chinese downhill on snowler blades from high camp to the chamois. With my prize on a roll of toilet paper, I unrolled it and it said free base jump. Whoa, I was elated. We loaded up Charles Bryan's plane with JT and Jeff McKittrick and flew to Idaho. We jumped off the prime bridge and learned that parachutes want to open up and malfunctions were definitely possible. He made 11 base jumps for me possible before he finally cut me off saying I wasn't good for the sport. (laughs) With Shane, it was always not normal. Everything was unimaginable to anybody else. From the first time I saw him doing backflips on a trampoline without spilling a cocktail in his hand, to teaching his two-year-old daughter, Girls Gone Wild, and dogs to hump his leg. We faked tan plain boy bunnies into our stomachs on my first heli shoot with Matchstick Productions, which he recommended me for. He put wasabi in the fish tank at the Fukang Chinese restaurant in Valdez to wash the fish poop. He also threw a piece of wasabi the size of a nickel across the room unnoticeably onto Hank DeBray's plate. We watched Hank eat it, and his face turned red, his eyes crying, and his nose dripping. We couldn't stop laughing. One beautiful time in Bella Coola, he and JT got us dry suits from Search and Rescue. We floated the river swimming down, seeing so many fish and eagles and so many unbelievable sights. There were ski lines that he did that never made the movies because they were too long and you could barely watch because you were too scared. At one of the first super parks in Mammoth on a 120-foot tabletop, which no snowboarder could clear, Shane decided to get towed in by a snowmobile. With lightning cracking in the distance, he dropped in like a god and got towed in a little too fast and flew 240 feet almost into the flats. I thought, here's an ambulance ride. But he got up, and to this day, it was the biggest air I've ever seen on a park jump. His bachelor party was a houseboat on Lake Orville, where everyone pounded beers and jumped off bridges with parachutes. His wedding was in Thailand with 150 crazy Tahoe people. One time at the World Extreme Skiing Championships in Valtese, he smashed a bottle over his head, but he got cut up really bad. The way he described it, grinding in his head was hysterical. I've seen him cross trees over raging, freezing rivers where a slip could result in death. I cried when he left us in Bella Coola with a blown knee. And I cried laughing when he would leave his underpants on the mountain because he was lactose intolerant. Everything Shane did was scary, funny, or loving. Under the crazy, talented, calculated shell, there was a loving, happy man. He always made you feel important and that anything was possible. He was so fucking talented, rules didn't apply. That's why hearing of his death for the first time seemed so unbelievable. There was no way the most talented man in the world was dead. We did so much crazy shit together that it just seemed that we would turn old and talk about it on rocking chairs watching the sunset. But life's not fair and nothing is a bunch of perfect sunsets. I miss him and wonder all the time what it would be like to watch him jump off something one more time or hug his family. So Aaron McGovern just crushed it, and that was my trip to Squaw Valley for the Payne McSlonky event. Some amazing stories about Shane McConkey came out. Like JT Holmes, Shane hung out with me a decent amount, and he was paid handsomely to do it. But the thing with Shane was, he never ever made skiing feel like a job, and he actually treated me like a friend. He would come into the K2 offices, and the whole workplace would stop. Everyone felt his friendship, as if you had skiing in common with him, he wanted to talk to you, and his goofy personality came out, whether you were a skier, snowboarder, or none of the above. He had a star-like quality to him that everyone in the world seemed to notice but him. 
He was always the funniest person in the room. He had the ability to make fun of someone in a way where he was always laughing with them and never at them. There were a lot of great stories told on this podcast, but I haven't told mine yet. I have a few, but this one is my favorite. When my wife, Ange, was pregnant, I emailed Shane and told him, hey, Ange is pregnant. And he came back with, yes, you had sex. Short, sweet, and totally McConkey. What a dude and what a life that he lived. I can't believe it's 10 years. The moral of this podcast is, there are some amazing people in this world and death sucks, so don't die. Now, I want to thank you for listening and ask you to review me on whatever platform you listen to me on. Email me with any questions or concerns you have. My email is mike at thepowellmovement.com and I will get back to you. Finally, I want you to buy all your skis, snowboards, bikes, surfboards from Evo, drink 10 barrel, hydrate with rescue water, trust me, it works, and see with a stylish pair of spy sunglasses or goggles. Have a great week, everyone.